Okay. So, is more or less everybody here or a lot of people missing? I don't know. people still coming. Do you hear? Do you hear now? Okay, better. Okay, let's start. Um, so yesterday with Mateo, uh, with all the problems we experienced with the computers and everything, I hope we, uh, he made clear um, that it is possible to use neural networks, uh, and in particular deep neural networks, to, as a universal function approximator. Okay? So he showed an example in which he was combining just uh, two nodes just to produce any kind of bump, uh, like he was, he was producing, uh, given a certain input x, and com combining two sigmoidal functions with uh, some weights. He showed essentially that uh, if you combine again with another sigmoidal function here with other weights, uh, w, or even just linearly. Uh, with. and with some biases, you can get any kind of uh, function which is like this, or like this, or something even like more closer to a Gaussian and everything. So using uh, a combination of many of these uh, uh, let's say, a nested kind of structure with all these uh, uh, building blocks, you can imagine that you can uh, actually build any function uh, that you want, even of more than one variable. Okay, so if you, you, you have more than one variable, you can make this, approximate any kind of function by just tweaking this, uh, these parameters in a, in a deep neural network. So what he used it for, uh, he used these kind of structures that I'm going to, to discuss in more detail today um, to basically solve the optimality Bellman equation for the Q function, so for the uh, state action uh, value function. Um, now, that was a bit, let's say, complicated example. So today what I want to, to show you is how to use this for a more, let's say, self-contained uh, example, which is handwritten digit recognition. Okay, so which is uh, basically how to uh, classify correctly uh, pictures like this. So for, I give you a picture of this kind, which is basically an array of, uh, in this case, in the NIST database, it's like a picture which is 28 times 28 pixels, grayscale, where uh, zero corresponds to white, one corresponds to black. And giving you this array, you, uh, you want to, uh, to tell me what is this number. So you have, a, you have a, a map, you want to construct a map that given you, that given an array which is like 28 times 28, grayscale, so for example, it's something like this, okay. I want to construct a map that gives me like a map F, that gives me something in a set which is zero, nine, okay? So this is a complicated map because, uh, I mean, it's a, this is a huge space. It's uh, the space of digits, if you want, is like contained in a, like in a interval zero, one to the 28 times 28. So it's a huge uh, set. Okay, of, config, of possible configurations. And you want to learn how to map this thing into a set of numbers zero, one, zero, 09, okay? Uh, so this is the goal. We want to be able to classify, given a set of, uh, of pictures, okay, of this kind, we want to learn how to classify them correctly uh, 
into numbers, okay? So this is the goal. So if I give you 10,000 pictures like this, I want you to get as close as possible as 10,000 hits and uh, no misses, okay? Um, so, and what I'm going to show is that essentially what neural networks of the kind that Matteo uh, presented yesterday and which are deep, deep feed forward neural networks, I'm going to discuss only this today, um, are able to approximate this function very well. I'm going to call f, uh, f hat, which will depend on parameters of the neural networks, which are weights and biases. Yeah. Sorry? No, no, this is zero, one. So this is grayscale. So it's a continuous variable which goes from zero, which is white, to one, I mean, this is the opposite on the blackboard, but it's, uh, it's zero when there's no color, okay, and, uh, and one when there's color, okay? So you can do the other way around, but it's grayscale. What are the Bs? What are the Bs? Uh, we're going to show. If you want, this is, okay, let's call this like uh, theta. Okay, so it's like some parameter, a set of parameters of your function that tries to approximate this fun this actual function. So this is a function that uh, I cannot express like uh, explicitly. It's very difficult. It's very complicated. How can I say how to map like this array into a set of numbers which is this small? So what I'm going to show is that there's a smart way of parameterizing functions like this, which is through uh, deep fit forward neural networks. Okay. This is the task uh, of, um, of today. So what do you think is the best way of, uh, let's say, if, if I manage, let's imagine this problem. I, I want to ask you how to, let's say, let's say that you don't have any idea of what 0, 1, 2, 9, you don't have any knowledge about algebra. You're like uh, coming from an a extra, extra solar planet or whatever. You, you don't know what these numbers are. So what do you think? is the best way for me to teach you this kind of, uh, this kind of classification problem. Any idea? Yeah? Okay. So, okay, so you want to use the correlations in a picture to determine what is uh, a number, to associate it with the output. That's kind of uh, what's happening, okay? So, examples. Okay, okay, that's the answer that we are going to to use today. So I give you the picture and I tell you the solution. Okay, so this is an example of uh, uh, supervised learning. So it's a learning with teachers. So I'm the teacher, I show you the picture, and I also present you the solution. So uh, humans do this very, very well, because, I mean, if I show you, imagine that I want to show you, to, to, to teach you what's, uh, what's the concept of a, of a dog, or of an elephant, or a giraffe. So if I show you three pictures already, you are able to generalize to other pictures of giraffes, and you already get, you know, you, you already tell me, oh, this is a giraffe. Maybe there's a, an animal which is very close, to, very similar to a giraffe, and maybe you're confused, but still, this is the kind of uh, a kind of training that um, that that works with humans. So let's try to to make it work with uh, artificial neural networks. Okay, another approach could be that I don't tell you the solution, I ask you what's your answer, and I tell you these are the possibilities, and I give you a punishment if you are not, uh, if your answer is not correct, or I give you a prize if your answer is correct. So this is instead a kind of, instead like a form of reinforcement learning approach to this kind of problem. But it turns out that, I mean, as, yeah. Yeah, so if my punishments are very harsh, then you learn fast. But if, you, if they're not, maybe, or, or if my punishments are stochastic, for example, you tell me this is a two and I slap you anyway, so then you're not going to learn very, 
I mean, very fast. But yeah, so it's anyway effective, but it takes longer time. Okay. So, but anyway, uh, the thing that um, that we will happen today is like we 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 use supervised learning. Okay. Um. So basically, what we have, we have a, a set of uh, of pictures of, of of couple of pairs. Okay. Of uh, of pictures and the answer. For example, I give you this, and I tell you that this is a two. Okay, I give you another another example, and uh, for example, uh, I don't know something like this, and I tell you that this is a five, etc. Okay, as we said, and every time I tell you what what the answer is, uh, and then the task is. What if I show you a picture that we are, you have never seen before? Are you able to recognize it or not? And the measure of the performance will happen like this. So this is like the training. These are like the training data. That I show you together with the, with the answer. And eventually, at the end of the training, I present you another set of, just a set of, uh, of pictures, okay, and I ask you what are the numbers corresponding to this, and I tell you how many hits or misses you you got, and this measures the performance of your algorithm, okay. So this is going to to say how how well you are able to generalize uh, from data that you have uh, you have been fed with uh, to data that you have never seen, okay. So. That measures how well you learned the concept of two, five, and so this is a very simple thing, but these kind of networks work also with uh, very complicated things like uh, animals or like uh, even dynamical data or not really this particular kind of networks, but um, so actually these kind of networks are able to generalize quite well, okay? And yeah. Well, the thing is that uh, you don't really need to keep all of them in memory because the approach that we are going to use is like doing a stochastic gradient descent of some kind of performance or cost function that I'm going to show. But basically, if you have a stream that comes in, uh, you, you, you take this stream and you process it in a way. So by, and, and, and by processing these, I mean you train the neural network, you train your parameters, you tweak your parameters, as the stream of information comes in, okay? So yeah, you need to store it, but it's not really limiting because you can store like terabytes of data without any problem and you can process it like uh, online somehow. So it's not really an issue. I mean, it, it runs on my laptop and I get human level uh, uh, performance. So it's, it's not really, but for more complicated things, I don't know. Uh, I mean, one has to try. So, so this is going. So this lecture today could be like more uh, suited for like a cooking class because it's like more like uh, you know many uh, say uh, tricks that are kind of motivated by say more fundamental issues that I'm going to point out. I hope, but then the real implementation of it really requires like a lot of uh, trial and error, and um, so. And of course, you have to balance the trade-offs with uh, like memory that you require, computational uh, load or whatever, and uh, and performance somehow. So this is like the test data. And eventually, you, you use some training data, and then you use some test data that you have never seen before to see what's your performance. Okay. So this is the task. And uh, so, but how do we? Uh, so now, okay, how do we train the data? So let's say, um, how do we formalize this learning? So learning is somehow has in, like, uh, involves some kind of optimization, right? So you want to optimize some performance. So how would you formalize this performance? 
So what is the function in other terms that you want to maximize or minimize? Any guess? So if I forget about this. So you have this, func you have this uh, stream of data, so you want to build, you have input and desired output, okay? So how can you build some performance function that, that I want to optimize in, in order to learn how to classify correctly? A gain function. Probability. Okay. Okay, so uh, if I, I, okay. Okay, so basically you, you give me, I don't know, I have a set of numbers, okay, and I build some uh, probability that this picture that I showed you is, uh, is, uh, is that number or is another one, etc. cetera. And you, and you choose w which one is the, the highest, with the highest probabilities. For example, this is zero, one, two, three. So this is the highest, let's say, so you choose, you say that this picture is three. This is how you, okay, so this is like the answer by the, by your machine. Your machine tells you, okay, this is a three. So how would you, would you say, how would you measure the performance now? So this is the answer. Okay. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, let's say performance function. Well, let, 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 me, let me phrase it in terms of cost. Okay, so num okay. So cost function. So one proposal by Alessandro. Alessandro says, okay, the number of miss. Misses, okay? So number of errors, number of wrong classifications, right? Okay, this is a good measure of performance, but it turns out to be not efficient to train the network. Any other ideas? I mean, Okay, so this is the most obvious one, but we would like, for a reason that I show you later, uh, in, in a second, some kind of function which is a continuous function of the output and, and of the output of the machine and the desired output. So with this hint, can you guess another cost function? Sorry? Combination or wrong, yes, but how? Yeah, okay, so let's, let's, let's go more to the structure of this network and then let's ask you this question again, okay? Let's see how this network is done. Uh, yeah? That's uh, that's closer to the real. I mean, I, I probably it's it's actually the real thing that we are going to do. Now, so let's talk about the, the this network, how it's done, okay? And then we try to, with this in mind, we try to to come up with some cost functions which make sense. Now, we said that. Um, so you had a tutorial on uh, on neural networks, so I don't explain what a neuron is in artificial neural networks, what weights are, biases, or are you, I mean, are you familiar or are you not familiar? You're not familiar, okay. Anyway, um, so the neural network that we use today is a deep neural network, and, and it's a deep fit forward, fit forward neural network. Okay, I hope you guessed the, 
the short and notations here. Okay. Uh, deep, uh, I mean, first of all, neural network. Okay, neural network is a network of neurons. Easy enough. But what is a neuron? Okay, a neuron is some unit, okay, that I represent with these circles, which receives some input, okay, and gives you out an output, okay? So these inputs are, let's call them uh, X, or let's say, okay, in a network, these inputs are the outputs of other neurons, okay? So if I have another, uh, another neuron here, this will give input to this other neuron, and so for the other arrows, okay? So I call the output of a neuron A, so which is its activity in this case, uh, which is, it's going to be in, in this particular example, like the probability of it being active, okay? Probability of it being active means that, so this number is going to be or z z between zero and one, continuous function between zero and one, a continuous function of its inputs. Uh, and the function that transforms the inputs into the output, I call it the activation function that I denote by sigma, okay? So sigma is the activation function. Okay, and the input is a, is a in, in our particular example, is a linear combination of the outputs of other neurons, okay? Which are like upstream in this flow, okay? So, the activity of this neuron here, let's say that's neuron I, and these are neuron J's, okay, many J's. The activity of neuron I is a function of over all the, it's a function sigma over all the, of a sum, of a linear combination of all the neurons which are upstream, okay, which give input to this, times some weights to the neuron I from the neuron J, times the activity of neuron J, so it's a linear combination of, of these ones, plus something that we call a bias, okay? Simple enough, I mean. This somehow sets, let's say, so let's, let's say something about this sigma. So this sigma that we are going to use today, it's a sigmoid function, which as a function of z, of, of this input, is one over one plus e to the minus z. If I write here, do you see everybody sees here? If I write here? Not really? Okay. So this is something that looks like this. So z, this is, when, when this is lowered, much, much smaller than zero, because minus infinity, Am I right? Yeah. So it's zero. Then here it increases. And then it goes to one at plus infinity. Okay? Something like this. So if I look at this as a function of weights and biases, the strength of the weights somehow, or let's say, uh, yeah, the strength of the weights says something about how, how narrow is this region in which this uh, activation function is kind of sensitive. Okay? So in, in which it varies quite a bit. And these b's here instead, I mean the ratio between b and w sets where this, active, where this neuron is going to be activated, okay? So it's a kind of, so minus this b is a kind of threshold, okay, which sets, okay, before this threshold the neuron is going to be inactive, so sigma is going to be zero, a is going to be zero, and beyond this threshold is going to be active with almost one, probability one, okay? Uh, now, now, this is the building block, okay, of the neural network. Now, it's a neural network, so there's a network underlying. So it's, that's going to be the most more interesting part. Now, um, can I cancel here? It's very clear. The, Okay, so deep fit, for, deep fit forward neural network. So deep, okay, and, and also fit forward means that the structure of this network is done 
like a lasagna, basically. It's like a, la it's a layered structure, okay? In which the contribution to each layer The contribution to each layer comes only from the neurons in the layer before, okay? And so these are going to be like arrows like this and so on, and also for all of this, okay? So in between two layers, we have full connection, okay? All of these nodes are connected to all of these nodes. But what is forbidden is that you don't have connection between nodes in the same layer and between nodes which are like far by more than one layer, okay? So you don't have connection like this. So this is forbidden or maybe I can write here so it's more clear. So this is forbidden and you don't have connections like this. These are forbidden, okay? Uh, so this means, this, this is what is called a, a feed forward neural network because uh, so you see that the, the output of neurons is just fed forward to the, new, to, to, the, to the next layer. And it's only forward, it's never backward. So that, that is a property which is very nice because it allows us to, to use an algorithm which is called backpropagation, back which works only for this kind of structure, for this kind of, for, this, for lectures with this kind of structure, okay? So you don't have arrows like this. You don't have bi-directional arrows. So in which basically um, the output of a neuron also becomes a, its input through this other neuron, right? So it's a bit of a, uh, like this, okay. So these are, these are other neural networks which are very interesting. They are studied in the literature, but are not, so there are no algorithms which are as efficient as the ones that I'm showing you now for, for training, okay, for supervised learning. Um, okay, so what do I want to say? Um, okay, so this is the thing. So these are the, the, the weights to each of the arrows. Uh, let's say that this is neuron uh, I1, I2, I3, and this is neuron J. So this is W, I1, J, W, I, 2, J, blah, 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 okay? And, uh, and to each node is also associated a bias. B, I, 1, B, I, 2, B, I, 3, okay? So which are like this kind of, uh, it's associated to this threshold, so okay. So the, 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 level, at, the level of input such that uh, the neuron is, uh, is active beyond that level. Okay, and so, okay, this is, a neural, this is a neural network that we are going to use. It's deep because it has, in general, more and more layers, okay? So I'm going to, sh so the, the one which is already, already has a good performance uh, is one in which you have the first layer, which is the input, okay? It takes the picture at this side, so it's the input, and gives you, and with one intermediate layer and one output layer, already gives a good performance. So this is get the kind of structure that we, that we use today and later we develop with, with more layers as well. Yeah, output, one, the first layer, sorry, input the first layer, output the last layer, which is the third, and one hidden layer. Yeah, all, exactly, so all, 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 the, all the layers which are in between are called hidden layers. So here we have one, it's proved, it's, there's a theorem that says that we, by using uh, sigmoid functions which are not, sorry, activa uh, activation functions which are non-linear, for example, sigmoids, uh, with only one intermediate layer, you can represent any function, provided that you have enough, enough that this layer is big enough, so you have enough parameters to, to tweak and to, to adjust, okay? Okay, a deep neural net, uh, a neural network is a more general uh, class of, of network. So it's, 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 just, it's, it's just a combination of any kind of this, of this sort. But 
it also includes like possibilities like uh, I don't know that the thing feeds itself uh, its own thing or that let's say you also have uh, something like uh, like this it goes to another so you also have loops for example no so this feeds like this so you also have this kind of structure but we don't want them just for practical purpose okay because the algorithm that I'm going to use uses the fact that the neural network has this structure which is layered and it's only feed forward okay never feed back and never feed too much forward okay now this thing is uh, now we discuss about so the input how to choose the input layer the input layer is like the for example in image recognition is all the bits that sorry all the pixels of my picture okay so I will feed here a vector okay the input is a vector is a vector x which is in this uh, space 0 1 to the 784 okay which is the I guess yeah 28 times 28 what about the output any idea how how the output should be from 0 to 9 so what do you mean from 0 to 9 who said that okay so what do you mean from 0 to 9 Okay, so you want the output to be, uh, we call it Y, or if you want, we call it A of the last layer, okay? So this is uh, the, the output of this, uh, of the last layer, we call it, so we, we, we denote it, let's say, that this L is equal one, sorry, this is L2, layer one, and this is, layer L, which is three in this case, okay? We, we label them like this with a letter L. So the, the output of the, of the last layer, this is in general what, what we have, uh, you say that it's a number. So it belongs to the integers. And in particular, it belongs to zero, nine. That's what you will say? Okay, other ideas? Binary representation. So basically it belongs to, it's a vector uh, which gives you, which is in R4, uh, if you were like 0, 1 to the 4 or to the something N. And gives you, for example, if I give 8, this gives you 0, 0, 0, uh, no, no, but 1 times 2 to the 3 and then 0, 0. So this is, uh, so but how many bits you use? Yeah. Yeah. I would say that you need four. Because two to the three is eight, so you don't get all of nine. You need at least four. Okay? So for example, a more parsimonious thing is that this belongs to to this state. Okay, so you have four units in the last layer which which code for the binary representation. Okay. Other ideas? What do you mean? Okay. Okay, so this is, a, if I understand correctly, this is like this, okay? So each of these numbers is like the probability of, uh, of that Okay, so okay, so basically you want to get out a probability distribution over this set. Okay, so this is a good thing. So it's neither of them, okay? But though this is a smart way, okay? But, and, but it's not useful for constructing the, the cost function, but it's uh, the closest answer to this problem, okay? So bo all of them would be good. Uh, this is not particularly good because it, it relates to what your colleague said that it's, uh, it's not a good answer for practical purposes. But these are both good in principle, okay? And I'm going to show that it's something like this, the output, okay? 
So let me say that for now that this is the answer, okay? And then we use, uh, we, we say what, how do we use, how we use it. So, okay, so the output layer, because of this uh, sigmoid function which goes from zero to one, okay, it gives out some uh, activities, okay, which are between zero and one. Not necessarily that the sum of them has to be one, so it, that's why it's not a probability distribution over the, the numbers. But it not be to be it not needs not be uh, normalized, okay, for practical for practical purposes. So what I'm going to use is that the output a l is going to be a vector. Uh, how do I write it? Something like this, which is uh, a l uh, zero, a l nine. Okay, it has ten components, and each of them belongs to zero one. Okay, so this is what my output gives out. Okay, yeah? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, yeah, we have 10. I, I, I know, yeah. just allow me to draw a few, just not to make a, I, you want me to put, okay, these are 10. No, I mean, it's just, this was a just pictorial thing, but uh, so we, and, 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 and these, for practical purpose, the, the idea is that you have like around 100 here. So I don't draw 100, I think. But that's, uh, yeah, that's correct. So here we have 10, okay? All of them which output a number between zero and one, okay? And the answer that we are going to use, so the answer of the classification problem is going to be which one of these is maximum, which is related to what Alessandro was saying, okay? But we use this vector to construct the cost function, okay? So the cost function that I propose, okay, so it's not, not me actually, but I mean, you know, okay, someone else proposed, is um, for a given input, x, okay, the cost function for this given input is one half the square, uh, the, 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 the Euclidean distance between the vector of the desired output, which is y, now I'm going to, 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 to say what it is exactly, minus, uh, so the Euclidean distance between the desired output vector, y of x, minus the output of the neural network squared. This is the Euclidean distance squared. This is one proposal. It's not the only one, but it's one. Yeah? No. No, what do you mean? What, what do you mean one maxima? You can have two, yeah? Okay. Okay. So these are continuous variables. It's very difficult that you get two exactly equal. Yeah, but you might have a, a different way of decoding the output to say to get an answer. For example, I don't know. I set to one all the outputs which are be beyond a certain threshold. Like for example, if you have two which are beyond like 0 0.9, for example, then you have a, an output which is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and that's a kind of confused answer. You don't know whether it's one number or the other. It, it's one way of decoding, but this gives you only one number, okay, for, for the answer, okay? Uh, but but that's, that's exactly a problem when you want to decode a kind of answer like this, like the binary representation. Because how do you choose which bits are going to be on and which bits are going to be off? That's a, that's a problem with, with this kind of uh, output layer. But let's stick to that. So there were other hands, no. Uh, so this is one, one, one particular thing for a given input. And now the cost function that our network is trying to minimize actually is a function C, which is the average over all the training data. Okay, so this N is the size of this vector of training data. Is the arithmetic mean of this cost function Cx for any given input. Okay, does that sound uh, good, yeah? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, 
the, the NIST data set, the data set that we use to train data, is made like this, actually. So it's a vector of 784. So it's just made, the, the table is made as an arrow, as an array, sorry, of 784 and a vector of length 10. Okay, we need this is from zero to one. And the in, there's only one index, which is one, which is the index corresponding to the number, okay, to the, to the, to the answer, and all the others are zero. Okay, so, uh, okay, so that just for, for example, zero, zero, one, uh, zero, blah, 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 this is equivalent to two. Okay, zero, one, two, okay? So this, this is the output. This is the, uh, the desired output. It has something, it has, it has to be something which matches uh, the, the, our last layer, okay? You want to, to compare like you, you, the, the actual output that you would like to have, to have a, an unambiguous answer. And uh, so you want to give data which are like, uh, the, which have the same structure. If, you were, if we were using this kind of output layer with binary representation, I mean, then you will, you have to give, like for example, two would be something like uh, with four units. And uh, if you say that this is corresponding to two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, and two to the three, then it's going to be zero, one, zero, zero, for example, okay? But if you have, for, and this is two, but if you have five, for example, then five would be, I don't know, uh, one, uh, zero plus four. So this is five, but you have two bits which are on. So again, you have the problem of decoding your last layer to get an answer. Okay, so it's a, um, I mean, I don't know how to address this problem. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty, you might find out that this works very well and you might, instead, it doesn't work very well. But it's just a, a heuristic uh, answer. You try, it doesn't work. And by the way, I'll give you the code, so you might want to try this thing if you want and see the performance. I haven't. Um, okay, so this is a cost function. Uh, of course, it's not, this is just a proxy to say how well you're doing, okay? It just guarantees you that if you get zero for every tri trial input, you're, you're a monster. I mean, you're, you're very good, okay? But it doesn't mean that if, you were, if your cost function is not zero, you don't get the answer correct, okay? It's just a proxy that you say, you minimize this and you're guaranteed that you get the, the correct answers, okay? Uh, the nice thing with, of, about this, which is not a property of this instead, is that this is a continuous function of the parameters, okay? So this output, this one, is a fun, it's, it's our f hat, which depends on the weights and biases of our input, okay? Is the function given by the, by the neural network. And this object here depends con in a continuous way on, the, on these parameters, okay? Well, this doesn't. Numbers are uh, discrete, okay? Even if you want to, uh, to take an average or, or like a percent, oh, what happened here? Did I, ah, oh. oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so you see, so this is a discrete thing. I mean, even if you say, okay, it's a percentage and you take many, many data, the percentage would be something close to a real number. But anyway, you need a huge sample in order to approximate with a real number. And anyway, you don't know how to, how to optimize this function in a continuous way. The idea why we want a continuous function is because we want to use a, an, uh, this, this kind of learning method is called a, that we are going to use is, uh, is going to be a stochastic, a stochastic gradient descent, okay? So we want to, we start with an initial guess of the parameters, W and B, which are the weight and biases of this neural network, okay? Some guess that one has to, let's say, devise uh, wisely, okay? And uh, we need to have an estimate of the gradient of this function, of this cost, sorry, of this function, 
with respect to the parameters, okay? And then update your, my parameters by just descending the gradient. So this is like how uh, stochastic gradient descent works. It's stochastic because in the end, what I'm going to do is that, what the neural network is going to do is that is, it takes a stochastic, uh, this function in the end is a stochastic quantity. We will evaluate the gradient of a stochastic function, okay? We estimate this gradient in order to move. So this is why it's stochastic. It's gradient descent works very well also with not stochastic function. You take just a, a well-defined function and you just uh, compute the gradient and you make small steps in order to get to the minimum. So this is a stochastic thing, so in the end it's going to be a noisy search of the minimum, but anyway it works. Um, okay, so can I erase here? Uh, of C, of C. In the end the cost function, because we want to be optimal, not with only one input, but with many, okay? Uh, yeah. Okay, so stochastic uh, gradient descent, how does it work? You have a function, okay. Uh, you, you are in a certain point, uh, let's say W and B, okay, you are our, in our parameter space. We compute the, the gradient of this function with respect to this uh, compute DC, DW all the parameters, all the weights, and uh, we see in the B, the biases. Okay, we compute this, and what we do, we do something like this. We do the next parameter, the next set of parameters, W and B, let me write one at a time, W is going to be updated to be W prime equal to the previous W, minus something which is proportional to the derivative of the cost function with respect to W, okay? The derivative of the cost function with respect to W evaluated at the current estimates, okay? Let's say that this is like WT and BT with some time which is whatever, okay? This is going WT plus one. WT, this is evaluated at WT and uh, BT. Okay, times are something which is called the learning rate that I call eta, okay, which also has to be chosen wisely, okay, because you want to make uh, small steps. Otherwise, you have a function like this, and if you're here, you take the gradient, it's like something like this. You make a jump like this, you never converge, okay? So this learning rate has to be small enough. Again, also this requires a lot of cooking and uh, trial and error to find it. You have to set one. So this is the learning rate. Okay. So this is the stochastic gradient descent. The stochastic gradient descent, I mean, here is like just gradient descent. There's no stochastic here. I mean, C is some function. The stochastic thing comes from the fact that this C is sampled, this gradient, is measured as a stochastic sample from our data. So I, I indicate it like this. So it's me, meaning that it's a kind of a sample average over my, over my training data, okay? Okay, so this is the stochastic gradient descent thing. Now, natural question from you, I would like. <laughs> what's, what's missing now? Eta, we fix it. B, ah, B, 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 of course, yeah. B, B has to be also updated. At B, T, and omega, T. Sorry? Exactly. So, question is, how do we calculate the gradient? Okay, how do we calculate the gradient? Is basically the core of these uh, training algorithms. And it's called uh, 
there, it has a, I mean, it, it gained a lot of attention because it works very well. And it's called backpropagation, okay? It's an algorithm that works uh, for this particular network, which are like layered and fit forward, okay? And I'm going to, I'm going to derive the equation of this, uh, of how this algorithm works, okay? Uh, so, can I erase this? Cost functions, is it clear? Now, um, here is the, so it's like, it's like an analytic derivation of how the algorithm works, but you, I mean, it only requires to know how to take derivatives of functions, so it's not really a, an incredible task. Okay, so first of all, we want to define, we define a quantity that is going to, be, it's a, going to be an, an auxiliary variable for our algorithm. Uh, which measures somehow the distance from optimality, okay, of our network. Optimality meaning how far we are from the, from C equal to its minimum, okay, given our set of data. So I define this as the error, okay, which is defined as, I, I denote it as uh, delta I L, so where L is the index of the layer, so it's, the, it's a quantity defined for every neuron in the, in, the, in the network, okay, every unit in the network. So for every layer and for any unit, any neuron inside this layer, okay? So if the layer two has 10 neurons, then if this is two, this goes from zero to 10, to nine, okay? So just, uh, it should be clear, okay? And this is going to be the derivative of the cost with respect to the input, I denote Z the input, of, lay, of neuron I in the layer L, okay? So this is a, I mean, I don't have a transcendental meaning of this thing. I mean, a deep, deep meaning of what this is, but let's read it backward. I mean, if you have this, if you have derivative of, with respect of the cost with respect to the input of this neuron equal to zero, it means that your network already is at optimality. So your cost, you are at the bottom of, of, your, of your cost. So you're at least in a local minimum, okay? And the delta is zero. So when, when this is zero, this is zero. So that's why it measures like the distance from optimality somehow. Um, well, if you are, and uh, okay, and, and and Z Z is the input is the input of uh, uh, neuron I in layer L. Okay, and it's calculated as as we saw before as the sum over the J, which belongs to the neuron of layer L minus one. So it's the input, so the, it's, it's summed over the neuron in the previous layer. So this is the feed forward part of the network, okay? Of uh, W, let me write it, W L minus one uh, I L. Ij, sorry, times the activity of the neuron at layer L minus one, neuron J at layer L minus one, and then plus the bias, okay? And this A is actually, is actually uh, sigma of Zj L minus one. Okay, so it is a recursive uh, uh, expression for the inputs at successive layers, okay? Um, okay, so with those two expressions, now we derive the, this, this algorithm, the equations for this algorithm, which is called back propagation algorithm. 
Okay. Now we start by by by, by one simple um, expression, which is the error at the output. Okay. So the delta i of the last layer of the output layer, delta. Uh, what is it? It's the derivative of the cost with respect to uh, the input to the next to the last layer. So the z l yeah i. Now, uh, actually, the cost depends on on the input through the output. So we said that c, if you want, is a function. Uh, sorry, it's uh, it's a it's a function that, for example, is for any input x. Okay, let's imagine that now that they, let's let's imagine that here we have x. So for any given input, okay, we want to do this. That's what the algorithm is going to do actually. So for any given input, we we have this derivative and c x. We said, for example, in this case, is one half the if you want sum over i sum over j of the output of uh, y j, which is going to be a delta over the, a chronic delta over the right answer, okay, minus a l j squared, okay? Uh, for example, it's one, yeah? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these, these all depend on x in this. Yeah, yeah. So this is a function of x, but I don't write it just because uh, it becomes too much. But yes, it depends on uh, on the data that that I have. Okay, so this cx depends on z through the output through this formula. Okay? So basically, we can apply a chain rule by saying, okay, I take the derivative with respect to the output, which has this as input. So derivative with respect to AL i times the derivative of AL i with respect to the input, okay? So this we know because it's given by the definition of our problem. We define a cost function and this we take the derivative and we just code it, okay? And this we also know because we know that the activation is just sigma of z. So this is basically sigma prime of z i l, okay? This is the first uh, formula that is going to be used. Uh, I cancel here. Anymore. Can I erase the network? Uh, okay, so I should speed up. Um, so, okay, so basically what do you do? Your algorithm does this. It, it takes the input, it goes, it feeds forward in the network until you get to the output. You get to the output and you get these Z's and these A's and everything, okay? And you calculate this, okay? For, the, for all the neuros in the output network, on the output layer. And then you want to calculate this delta L for all of the previous layers, okay? Now the back propagation, back pro the name back propagation tells you how it's going to be done. So it's going to be fed backward to the previous layers, okay, in order to calculate them. And now I derive the equation for this, for this, uh, for this step. Now the second equation, which is the back prop, okay, is the main equation that is going to be that's going to be used is basically how to calculate delta i at layer L, small l, well, which is any of the previous layers, okay? For any L actually uh, except the first, so any L between two and L minus one. 
because the first layer is just the input, so it's given, okay? So there's no, there's no error there, it's just uh, the input, the picture, okay? Um, okay, so then again, definition, okay? And now again, so this delta, delta, delta Z I L determines what's going to be the output of the next layer. So I can use again the same, the same rule, I mean, applying the, I mean, unpacking this thing into derivatives in a chain, okay? And I can say, well, I can express delta C with respect to, I can, I can take the derivative of, of C, again, always this is Cx, huh? okay? If I miss it, oh, here for example, it's for one given input, okay? Uh, for this thing, with respect to, uh, to the Z of the next layer, okay? And then I multiply by, the der by, by delta. So if you want here, we have to sum over uh, all J's. of delta zj times delta zjl plus one. Okay. Clear enough. Now, um, is it clear what I've done here? It's, yeah. Um, okay. And now I use the fact that zj comes from this expression, right? zj at the next layer comes from the zj at zi of the previous layer. So it's just a shift of indices, but it should be clear. And it depends on it also through this, this sigma. So what is going to be, what is going to happen is that uh, basically this object is going to be equal to sum over j. Ah, this is by definition the delta j L plus one. Okay, it's the definition. Let's change the index. Okay, so this is going to be a sum over j of delta j L plus one. And then I take the derivative of this. Take the derivative of this, if you want, I first take the derivative with respect to A, which is going to give me the W, uh, the W, uh, j i l plus one, and then I take the derivative of the a with respect to z, which is sigma prime, okay? Sigma prime of z uh, i l, okay? Now, this is very nice because I derived a formula which tells you how to calculate the errors in the previous layer linearly, given the, the, the errors at the, at the next layer. It's like it's, this is a linear operation, so you have all the possible tools for doing linear algebra on your computer. So this is very, you can do it very efficiently, okay? And this is very nice because the, the only dependence on, of, of, of the units, of, of the, of the output of the units is only through the outputs of the previous layer units. So, uh, and so you can use uh, these this kind of tools. So, and the end here is just a matrix, okay? You can store this in a matrix and just multiply from the right of this to this vector and you get your, uh, your delta the previous layer. So this is the back propagation uh, formula. And now, okay, you say, well, okay, I, I, I've, I've derived, I, I've been able to calculate these deltas, so what do I do with them? Well, let's see how the derivatives that we, in the end, want, we wanted to calculate, we wanted to calculate the derivatives of the cost with respect to the parameters. We don't, what do we do with these deltas? Well, let's calculate then the derivative of C x with respect to the W L i j, for example. This is one partial derivatives that we, you, you want to use in your uh, training, I mean, in, in your stochastic uh, um, gradient descent. And so this is go going to be, I can express it as 
uh, again, chain rule. I mean, it's going to be like the very simple tool of uh, calculus 101, but I mean, it's going to be used in all the, in all the derivation. I have to sum over, I take the derivative of Cx with respect to something that depends on this thing, which is the z, okay, the zl, the zl uh, i, is that correct, oh, I mean, actually it's better to do k, in principle it depends on all the k's, no, let me write the, I mean, you can derive it yourself, it's very easy, but let me write the final expression, so, this, the only thing, the only z that depends on the wijl is the zil, okay? Doesn't depend on all the other, I mean, the other z's don't depend on this. So I write it like this, times the derivative of zil with respect to uh, w, wijl. And again, I use that formula over there for the fit forward. Okay, and uh, it turns out that this is going to be, uh, this, is, this thing is linear in the Ws because it's just the coefficients of the linear, uh, uh, of the linear combination. And so this is going to be, this is going to be delta I L by definition. And this is going to be only basically sigma of uh, Z I, L, right? So this is delta is sigma Z I L times delta I L. So this is, now we know why we, we introduce these deltas, that we propagate, because in the end it turns out that these deltas are proportional, to, that gradient are proportional to, this, to these deltas, okay? It's very, it's very simple. And then, Last formula, um, I write it here. The last formula is the gradient with respect to B. Just, uh, but the gradient with respect to B is even simpler because, because B, now again, same trick as before, delta C, always Cx here, with respect to Zil, it's the only Z uh, that depends on the, on the BIL, right over here, times delta Z IL with respect to B. Yeah? Um, um, maybe I'm wrong. Sorry. No, you're right, um, because the Z, uh, allora, so, <laughs> um, the WIJ determines the ZIL, so I have to take it. Yeah, right. Is that what you mean? <clears throat> so, wait a second. Um, might be a mistake, might be my mistake. Um, okay, so we take the derivative of the, so the W, C depends on W I J through the through the Z. Yes, you're right. You're right. So this is L uh, minus one. No, minus one. So, so if I take the derivative, uh, plus one. Right. I'm making a mess. I'm, i I realize. Um, Z L plus one. So wait a second. I take the derivative with respect to to W I L. So I take first the derivative with respect to 
ZL plus one, which depend on W. Uh, probably, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Probably the thing is that this is an L in my notes. And this is at L minus, minus one. That was my mistake at the beginning, sorry. Or, I mean, I'm sorry for the mess of indices, but uh, it should be like this. So then this, um, this thing is delta I L. Um, and this thing is delta Z I L for sure. And then I take derivative with respect to this, which is, uh, uh, which is correct. Sorry, I pro probably it was that index. Are you fine with this now? Not really. Are you okay? So yes, he says yes. So it's okay. Yeah, yeah, so the, the layers here go, this layer here goes from two to L because the first layer doesn't have any input. The input is X, is the, the data, okay, is the picture. So this L goes from two to L, I wrote it here, I guess, here. So the L goes from uh, two to L uh, because the, the A1, A1 is basically, I put it equal to x to my vector of uh, of grayscale pixels. Okay. So, okay. So, it should be correct like this. I'm sorry, I was I put a, I made a mistake there. But basically, you have a way of calculating the derivatives now. Okay. So you have a formula. Ah, so I'm finished this thing. So this is the error. So this is the delta i l again by definition. And this is very simple because uh, Z depends linearly on B. I mean, actually it's just an additive constant. So taking the derivative with respect to this or this is the same. Sorry, uh, derivative of this times or derivative is this is just, uh, derivative of this with respect to B is just one, okay? Depends on uh, trivial on B. So this is just one. And so this is just the delta, okay? Uh, so the derivative of C, given this input with respect to B is just the delta. And now with this, you take your, your, your step. You, you're ready to take your gradient descent step in your cost function. Yeah. No problem. Yeah? Sorry, I'm slow. Can can you say it again? Here. Top right here. Yes. Center left, wow. <laughs> center, le center left, center left here. Center left, yes. Here, okay. So there we should have e power ten k and minus Yes. No. No, because I'm thinking the derivative with respect to w, and then yes, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, sorry, I made some uh, confusion. I uh, also in my notes with, I got some formulas with the L plus one and some others. But the code is correct because it was written by someone else. <laughs> so, sorry? Yeah, yeah, it's just a uh, shifting of the labels. You have to be careful with that. And it's usually like uh, a mess, but okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, uh, there's no substantial thing except my dumbness. Okay. Um, okay, so that now we, we have this, but we don't take the step as every, so let's say 
Matteo yesterday talks about the, this mini batch, okay? This mini batch update. So this is actually a trick that is very useful to, to do stochastic gradient descent because it's a, it speeds up, it, it allows for, for, for the possibility to speed up your algorithm quite a bit by using some uh, already um, made uh, some uh, libraries for linear algebra. And also um, because, and it reduces a bit the noise, okay? So basically, the, the learning algorithm is going to work like this. Now, have you written the back propagation formulas so that I can cancel them? Or maybe, I mean, anyway, I'm going to show them on the laptop in a while, in a second. So, probably instead of writing, I can just, uh, Turn on the laptop, which is easier. Yes. Okay, it's going to turn on some at some point, I hope. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, okay, now let's write it. So the algorithm is, is, is goes like this. Now, you have some training data that we said is like a vector of like 784 uh, 84, uh, 0 to 1 real variables and a vector of uh, 10, which is your output, okay? And blah, blah, blah. You have many. You have n, okay? Now, the trick of the mini batch is that you don't calculate the gradient every time you get one data point, but you split this thing into some subsets of data. So let me call it uh, X for input and Y for output, which is the desired output, okay? X uh, one, blah, 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 of size M, okay, which is going to be uh, set there's no general recipe to set this length of this of this uh, subset, but uh, it's very important uh, to set it right. Right. Okay. Okay. So you have many of these subsets of data. Okay. This is what are called mini batch. So what, you, what happens is that essentially you take a batch, a mini batch of inputs, and after you have taken that and you calculated the gradient for all of them, you take a sample mean of the gradient over this mini batch, and then you take a, then you make a step, okay? So you take this and you calculate sum of one over M over the X which, be, which is inside this mini batch, okay? of dcx with respect to the, this, uh, let me call just w, but it has to be clear that it's uh, w's and b's, okay? And this is our mini batch, mini batch uh, average of the gradient, okay? Now, one comment about the cost function. The cost function has to be, it's, it's nice that it's a, a written as a sample mean of uh, cost functions for any given input because it turns out then that this, uh, the mini batch average is going to be an unbiased estimator of the gradient, okay? So it's not going to be uh, a bad estimate, okay? So you're always taking the good direction essentially. Uh, it's going to be noisy because this M is much smaller than the full string of data that you use for training, but it's going to be anyway pointing on average in the good direction, okay? It's going to be on average the, 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 good, uh, the good estimate for the gradient. So once, once you have taken this, then you do the update. As we said, the W is assigned to W, the old one, minus a certain small number, I mean small enough, times 
this mini batch uh, estimate of the gradient. Okay, so this is going to be the algorithm. Period. Okay, and after once you ex you have exhausted your uh, your string because uh, I mean you have a finite number of mini batch, you can test the goodness of your uh, of your thing. But the, the test has nothing, I mean, the counting of how many misses or hits you, you got doesn't provide you any information on how to train your data. It's just a test. That's your ultimate goal that you want to train your neural network for. But it's not going to enter into the algorithm, okay? The only thing that enters into the algorithm is this, this cost function that you set before, that you have to set in a smart way in order to achieve good performances. Is it? Uh, the flow is every all the flow is clear. Yes. Okay. So okay. Um, now I basically train myself on this subject by looking at this reference here. Um, it's a very nice book. It's very introductory. So it's a quite lengthy discussion and quite wordy discussion about how this thing goes, and it gives you a lot of uh, principles that I, I don't have. So it's much time to discuss um, of how to train, I mean, how to, to, to set these parameters, like for example, the size of the mini batch, this eta, or uh, how to choose wisely a cost function, how to choose wisely an initial condition of the Ws, which is not trivial either. So it discusses all of these kind of things that maybe I mentioned in, in the end. Now I want to, sh to give you a, a demonstration of how this code is made. Now I show you, so this is basically the, so the SGD function is this one, okay? So which is the stochastic, it's like the, the big function that does the training for us. So what it does is does it takes some training data, all the string. Epochs is just basically how many times you go through all the data, okay? You pass once over the whole set of data and that's one epoch, okay? It's just a matter of names. After this epoch, you can test how well you've done. But in principle, you go through it many, many epochs, okay? Many, epoch is just a, a name for a sweep, a sweep over all the data, okay? Yeah, you, you have to run it many times. It's because you have a limited sample. So what it's going to do is this. You see, you get the training data, and uh, okay, well, if test data means if you if you want to also to test uh, to test uh, your performance, you also give uh, as an input also this test data. In by default, is set to none, so you don't have any you, you don't test anything. But it's good to to check how how good is your training, how good is your algorithm. So okay, you 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 can set this flag to. Uh, to the name of the list of, of training data that you're using, of, of testing data that you're using. And then the main algorithm is basically this, okay? So for every epoch, so every time you go through your set of data, you shuffle them, okay? Because if you go through it with the same order, you might not, uh, you see, I mean, these mini batches will be always the same I mean, will be always the same data entering the mini batch. So it's it's a, just a way of getting better statistics over your estimates. Okay, you shuffle them, then you you divide your oops, I'm doing math. Okay, um, then you divide your data into these mini batches. Okay, and uh, and then for every mini batch, what you do is that you do self. Uh, I mean, oh, sorry, this, this, you apply this update mini batch. This update update mini batch basically does this. So it calculates the gradient, I mean, it, do, it does this. So it updates the weights by measure, by measure uh, estimating the gradient over the mini batch, like this, and into this step, it uses back propagation, okay? It's all a nested thing, but it's, uh, I mean, if you look at the, data, at the code, is quite self-explanatory, so it's, it's very nice. I think it's very well written. So this is the, basically the algorithm, yeah. No, 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 sorry, you say it again. So, so uh, when you are running through your data, uh, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's not for, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, e-books. Are, 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 you, are you remembering the, 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 sorry, the different runs are independent or not? The different runs? Different epochs, they just uh, do the same exact procedure, okay. but with just shuffle data. So you shuffle. Mm, what do you mean? I, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. You're, you're like, so you have only a, a small amount of data, of data and you're trying to. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you shuffle because you want to kind of. Uh, remove some kind of correlations that you have in the, in the estimates you want. Okay. Um, then the, the function that, okay, so I'm going to show you how the, the, the code runs just to, I mean, very little, but um, so the cost function that we, we implement, I mean, it's implemented here is the quadratic, uh, is this quadratic cost, okay? So any, any cost which is like convex in the output, okay? And has a zero or like a minimum in the desired output is uh, is good, okay? Uh, but it might be that it's not good for practical purposes because because maybe what happens is that these derivatives turn out to be zero or turn out to be very small, so you don't learn much. So you you want to devise uh, you want to define a better cost function in order to to avoid this problem of gradients which become too small. Because in the end, if you remember, the delta at the last layer is basically the, the derivative of the cost with respect to A, which is uh, something, okay? In the quadratic thing, this is just basically the distance between, uh, so A I L basically, this is just A I L minus Y I. So it's just the, 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 the how to say, the, the distance between uh, the, the, the error with respect, I mean, uh, from the, um, the deviation from the desired output. But then you also have a term which is sigma prime of the input. And now he will correct me on the indices. Unfortunately, he's not paying attention. Okay, no, it's like this. Uh, and if this thing is, since the sigma is a sigmoid function for our problem, if this z, z ends up here or here, this sigma prime is very small. And in general, with this kind of uh, sigmoidal uh, neurons, you encounter very often this problem of uh, vanishing gradients because you, these deltas become smaller, they become very small already at the output. And also, when you do the back propagation that I canceled, but it's somewhere here, when you apply this equation, okay, which iterates, goes backward in the layers, you multiply many times as many layers you have times this is a sigma prime. So it turns out that you, 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 your gradient, your estimate, your error in, in previous layer is smaller and smaller. So the derivatives are smaller and smaller. So the learning in the previous layers is smaller and smaller, it's slower and slower as you add layers. Okay, so but just to keep in, keep in mind that, for example, there's a nice uh, choice of, um, of cost function for this particular activation function, which is called cross entropy. Okay, which is a measure of somehow the the, uh, how to say, of the surprise somehow. It's like, it has an, an information theoretical, I mean, uh, uh, meaning, okay? Uh, it's a cross entropy, I wrote it here, and there's in this book that I gave you as a reference, there's a discussion of how this, why this is, this is better. But it's, the reason is simple, because when you take the derivative of, of, this, of this cross entropy function with respect to A, of, with respect to the output, this, this, this thing gives you one over this derivative. So this derivative cancels. And basically the error is just, purport, is just this, okay? For, for this choice of the cost function, okay? It's all well explained in notes. And, uh, and if you look at the code down here, okay? I, I wrote a part of the code where, where this, this is the definition of the cross entropy uh, cost function. 
if you take the derivative with respect to these, uh, log becomes one over a, here becomes one over one minus a. If you combine them, basically you have below, you have a times one minus a. And if you take the derivative of sigma with respect to z, it's basically sigma times one minus sigma. And so this sigma, so this is basically a times one minus a, which cancels this, okay? So it's a, it's a trick, but so nobody says, it's not a, a prescription by, by anybody, this thing, but it turns out that it's very good with the sigmoidal neurons, okay? Um, so this is a way of improving like uh, on the, um, the learning with the, cost, with the quadratic cost function, which uh, suffers from these vanishing derivatives already at the output, okay? Uh, and then here you have the code. Let's try to, so, um, okay, so one word about how the, the, the MNIST database is loaded into the program. Now, you see that this, this MNIST uh, loader, uh, load data wrapper function, whatever, it takes this uh, MNIST database and loads it into some lists, which are training data, validation data, test data. Now, uh, the reason why you have training data is, is basically this string with, they're all with input and output that you're using through this, for, for this stochastic gradient descent. But then you want to, you might want to test your, your, your network, okay, to see how many hits or misses you, you get, how many correct classifications you get. But, so then you say, why you use, why you need another uh, set of validation data? Any idea of why you want to use a second set of data? Some who maybe know something about this. No. So validation data is because it's a kind of test about how well your, your algorithm is learning, not about the performance. But, okay, so you might want to use one set of data also for setting these parameters, for example, like the mini batch size, the eta, or even the structure of the network, okay? So you might want to change these parameters as well, or I don't know, in the beginning, so here is not clear, but I mean, it's not written there, it's, it's in the code below. You might want to initialize your, your weights and biases in a different way. So if you, if you test your algorithm over one set of data only, you might end up saying, okay, well, my parameters that I'm, Tweak, I mean, these, these parameters, which are called hyperparameters, because are like parameters at a higher level, okay, about, about the, the way that the network learns, might be describing well this test data, but not others, okay? So I might do, I mean, uh, run into overfitting. So you are overfitting your test data. So you might want to check against another set of data. So this is like, it's called a holdout technique. So you, you keep one, te one test data to see how well your network is learning, okay, by changing the, the, the hyperparameters, this epochs, I mean, not epochs, but mini batch, eta, and other parameters, like when you introduce regularization um, to, to avoid overfitting of the training data, so I, I, well, I mean, I don't have time to go through it, unfortunately. Uh, you keep another set of data just to see how well you have set your, your, your hyperparameters, okay? No, I don't know, I don't think so. No, valid, valid, I mean, it's a, it's a name. You can call it test data one, test data two, test data three. So validation in the sense that you are, I don't have a deep understanding of why of the name, but yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, it's like validating your, uh, your 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 hyper your your training algorithm somehow here. Yeah. Is it information is information of the hyper parameters or there is So it's Yeah, okay. So there's a lot of as I, as I said before, I mean, it's a lot of uh, uh, cooking trial and error, okay? But there are some rules. I mean, there are some rule of thumbs that you want to use. Um, and it comes all from experience, okay? Which is not my case, but uh, so, for example, the mini batch size, it's something that, 
for example, in the notes that are, that are referenced there, is never changed, okay? But it's, it's something that you want to change at the end, okay? So when you are tweaked all the other parameters in a way, in some way, then you might want to see how well you learn with the, by changing the mini batch. The eta is one of the first ones that you want to see, that you want to change, okay? So how fast you go down, I mean, with one eta, if as a function of the update, so of the time step in your uh, stochastic gradient descent, if you choose different etas, you might find that one goes down like this, one goes down like this, much slower, one might do like this, and, and this is like the performance. So the percentage of, uh, of correct classification, for example. I mean, you clearly see that this is like not good, so you stick to one of these, then you set it. And then you try to try to say, well, you have other, many other parameters. For example, again, one very uh, common problem in uh, this, in this um, um, supervised learning things is, uh, is uh, overfitting, okay? It might be that you're very good at representing the test data, sorry, the training data, but then when I show you something different, you are completely confused and you, you, you maybe you have, you have learned the details of those pictures and not like the general, uh, the general, uh, let's say the, the higher order or like the more, uh, you haven't been able to extract like the, the, the higher level information somehow, no? So there are several, th there are several tricks to do this. Uh, one of them is general is to, to regularize the parameters, meaning to the cost, which is C0 is the, one of the costs that I wrote before, okay, like the square or like the cross entropy or something. You might want to add one other cost, which is like, for example, uh, lambda uh, over, uh, I don't know, n number of data times sum over all the links, so i and j and l, of w i j l squared. Now, if you use this cost, this is called L2 regularization. So L2 regularization. So it, L2 because uh, you add a cost which is the L2 norm of this, uh, of this vector of uh, Ws, okay? So, um, when you set this, basically this gives an update rule, which is W times one minus this thing. So uh, probably I miss, uh, so eta lambda divided N plus the derivative of the, of the, of the C naught, okay? Just for the Ws. In general, it's a good idea just for the Ws and not with the Bs because the Bs are not really important for overfitting, but the Ws are, okay? Again, this is a heuristic, uh, heuristic uh, evidence about the fact that the Ws, you want to keep them quite small in order to be able to generalize more, okay? Because otherwise you learn too much the details of the training data and not, you don't, don't generalize. And, but it turns out to be basically very simple because it's, uh, uh, it's just basically, a, you multiply the, the old W by a factor which is smaller than one so if you, your gradient becomes zero, you go back to zero, okay? By, if your gradient you evaluate it, it becomes always zero, the W goes back to zero, okay? I mean, it's just, uh, just exponentially or geometrically goes to zero. Um, okay, so this is one way to, pre to prevent regularization. And one parameter that you want to set also, one of the hyperparameters is this lambda, okay? This is also, an important parameter to set. After the eta, you might wonder how, which is the best lambda. And um, then there's other techniques of, for regularization, which is, um, so suppose that you want, to, you, you want to see, you monitor, and this is the case here. Let me run it while I talk. Um, is the here, is the example here, if I'm not, 
wrong. Okay. You might want to monitor both the performance on the training data that you're feeding and uh, the test data, okay? Imagine that you run through epochs here, okay? As I'm doing here. And I'm doing only 30, okay? Uh, what you see is that, well, now I wait for the graph. I ended up drawing it. So, yeah, we have two minutes. Okay, so I think it's plotting, okay. So what you see here is that I test while I train my network, I test both the performance on the training data, which goes up to 100%, okay, performance one. Why? Because I'm, I'm, very, I'm learning very well the training data, so I'm learning also the, the, particular, the details of my training data. But when I test it on the de test data, okay, it, it stops increasing, it goes to a plateau, okay? So the idea of regularization is that you want to tweak your parameters in order to reduce as much as possible this gap, okay? So if you're on your test data, you go to a level which is, you stop here, okay? For example, here you might say that here it's still growing a little bit. I, I used only uh, 1,000 data points for the training. If you use 50,000 already, increasing the number of data reduces this gap or already. So it's difficult to learn the details of many more data, okay? Um, but you might want to say, ah, okay, well, my network, I don't want to extend uh, my, my training above like uh, five or 10 epochs. Uh, this is a ridiculous number, but because the training data are very few. I don't want to extend more my training because if I go on more, I'm going to learn the details of the training data and not, I'm not able to generalize. So this is called early stopping, okay? So I stop at an epoch in which I realize that my performance on the test data don't, doesn't grow anymore while on the training data does, okay? So I stop before. So I prevent overfitting this way, okay? Okay. Uh, other methods, uh, again, I, I'm going through a list so that I, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the kitchen, okay? It's called uh, dropout, and I, 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 let, I tell you just this, then uh, it's done. Um, no, let me, let, I skip the dropout. I just tell you something else about uh, convolutional neural networks, which are like basically the, the best thing that you can do for, uh, for picture recognition and everything. So, so something that you, you might say, well, I want to recognize, uh, I want to classify pictures, I want to classify digits, for example, or like dogs and cats and elephants, okay? And so, but I mean, I have a picture like this of a one, okay? And I have another picture of this, of a one. So what's the difference? It's just translated. But my algorithm that, that I wrote there, it's extremely stupid because it doesn't see the translation. Or it doesn't see this. This is still a one. It's just a rotated version of this, okay? So I'm able to recognize because I, in, in my, I mean, in my brain, I don't know, but I mean, I, I, or because, I don't know, I recognize that there's some symmetry there, no? There's some kind of rotational symmetry, some kind of translational symmetry, and uh, people do that even if they're not mathematicians or physicists, so, the, so the, 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 you recognize this. And so how to implement this thing in, into a neural network that kind of implements these kind of symmetries? Is it possible or not? So it's actually possible in, for some kind of set of symmetries, for example, translation, Okay, because translation is basically something that leaves uh, convolutions, okay, invariant somehow. It's like a symmetry for convolutions. That, um, and, and this gives the name of convolutional neural network. So it's basically uh, networks that, that kind of take this picture, and this picture and that picture, 
and try to kind of, it, it blurs somehow this picture, okay? By translating, shifting, rotating, do some kind of symmetry, I mean, apply some, some, some symmetry transformations, small symmetry transformation, in order to, to kind of extract some kind of generality out of these pictures, okay? So there's a pre-processing that the machine learns by, by itself. Uh, it, it learns how to extract generalities out of, the, out of pictures which are just in, invariant by just uh, small transformations, some small trans symmetry transformations, okay? And uh, so I, I put in the, in the drive thing also the code which does this. If you want to, you, you look it up. And there's also a discussion in the notes of by um, uh, Michael Nielsen, and uh, which discusses about this. But this is basically the, the last uh, stage of, of, of these kind of uh, algorithms that perform very well also because, of the, because, of, uh, because they are able to recognize this kind of symmetries, okay? I, I'm sorry, I mean, I don't know about, about it very much and so, and uh, to tell you more, but uh, this is uh, it. And uh, any questions, uh, any more questions? Okay, I charge you now, okay, thanks.